Hello, KCIW listeners, and welcome to Curry Cafe, where we put together a panel of volunteers and guests who discuss various topics from whimsical and fun to more serious subjects. Well, hello again. This is Ray Gary at the Curry Cafe. As you know, this is a very informal show where we have guests come in and talk about a subject, and it could be anything from, well, as Rick just told you, whimsical to very serious. And today we're going to get serious, but it, it may lighten up a little bit. I don't know. Now, I feel sorry for any of you that are right now sitting inside listening to this. I hope you're in the car at the beach because it is absolutely beautiful out there. I uh, just came from the car show, which was really kind of neat. Uh, I'm kind of a car guy, and there's just all kinds of interesting things that I've never seen before. So run on down to the car show at the beach after this show, which will be over in about 58 minutes. So today we're going to be discussing protests, uh, all different kinds of protests. And we have gathered, as always, some of the finest experts I could find on the subject. And we can go around the table now and introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Robert O'Sullivan. I've lived in Brookings since 2015. My roots are in the Bay Area, Berkeley and Oakland specifically. And part of knowing that is related to the fact that where one grows up has a lot to do with what one knows about the world, uh, not just uh, where one goes to school, but just kind of the context. And uh, a lot of issues about protests in American history are happened because a lot of people just didn't know what was going on. And Vietnam would be a good place to talk about later to to to, to say that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. that's absolutely true. And living in Oakland, of course, you didn't really see any protests. Right? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, so many things come to mind. It, it, it's funny, autobiographically, I had a rather unusual childhood. My dad was 65 when I was born, and my mom was 44. And in those days, he was sort of an itinerant typesetter. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, I went to a lot of different schools. And when it came to be 14, I had to move from a kind of calm San Francisco suburb named San Mateo to Berkeley. And I hated the idea of moving uh, because that's not a good time to move anyway. But uh, uh, looking back, uh, Berkeley, even in those days, uh, was a much more interesting place than a lot of other places. And that deeply influenced how I felt about a lot of things. I have a friend that went to Berkeley. Do you think I could just introduce myself? Well, I'm just I, I'm just saying, right? Aren't I part of the panel? Come on. You will be. Just <laughs> relax. Uh -huh. I'm so relaxed. Oh, okay. Relax. Relax. I'm a producer. Oh. Bob and I are having a nice, interesting discussion here. <laughs> I have a little anecdote to throw in Great. that would be very clever. And you may screw the whole thing up, oh, which you've already had. Darn it. Which I anyway, have I have a friend it. that went to Berkeley during the time, and, and her uh, participation in the protests was one day in the swimming class, she got a slight whiff of tear gas. Ooh. So she can count herself as a protester now. Now you can introduce Victim gassed. <laughs> huh? I'm Candace Michelle, and uh, I have a show here on KCIW, our community. And um, this topic is one that really, really interests me. Um, I was part of the anti-war movement back in the 70s, and um, I believe firmly in being able to protest. And there's a lot to talk about right now, especially with the Palestinian-Israeli stuff that's going on. So I'm thrilled to be here. Good. Well, my, my introduction... And happy Memorial Day. I'm sorry? Happy Memorial Day. Oh, thank you. I guess. I don't know. Uh, my introduction to protests was when, I don't know, I was 10 or 11 years old and all that stuff was going on in places like Montgomery, Alabama. And it just... I could not understand why... They didn't want black people in their church, or they wanted to bomb churches and all this stuff. I grew up in Lily White, Long Island. The closest black person probably lived 20 miles away from me, and I really don't think I had ever spoken to a black person in my life at that point. So I was really in, in kind of a fog about it, wondering what that's all about. That changed after yeah. a while. Yeah, I bet. When uh, I 
the Vietnam War was going on, we, before I got drafted, I, I, I was my country right or wrong kind of a guy. And, and I thought, well, if they want me, and I, I have to go. And when I, when I did go, I sure as heck did not want to. And they uh, give you this raw, raw speech about how your fathers and your grandfathers are all here doing the same thing you were doing and uh, blah, blah, blah. And I, I've since realized that we, we, we were a little beyond that, but, but what a country has to do when it goes to war is get people to fight in the war. So in order to do that, they just con them into thinking it's their fight. We fight them there so we don't have to fight them here. Right. In uh, the Civil War, almost all of the soldiers were just yeoman farmers. None of them, or very few of them, owned slaves. And the ones that did own slaves, some of them brought them right along to camp with them. Mm. But they had they, they really had no skin in the, in, in the fight at all, but they were conned into going to war. Mm. We were conned into saving the world for democracy. Well, I remember that when I was growing up, um, I, I was also nowhere near any of the black neighborhoods. Um, and I didn't know, I had, I, I had no black friends. Um, and I, my dad told me the story later on that, you know, when, when I was about four, he was out walking with me or something, and we saw a black person. And I mentioned something like that to my dad. I said, like, you know, why, why is his skin a different color? And my dad was very liberal and said, you know, that's just the, his, that's just his, the color of his skin. He's exactly the same as we are and, you know, that kind of stuff. And that was my, my upbringing was very liberal. My mother was a little uh, lean towards being liberal, although she wouldn't have called it that. And my father was typical white guy from the time period. Mm -hmm. Had I asked them that question, I'm not sure what my father's answer would have been, probably something I shouldn't be able to say here. And my mother would say, oh, it's not his fault. Ooh, baba boom. That was, yeah. Well, it actually wasn't. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but, but still. She, but she did frequently say there's good and kinds and all, good good and bad in all people. Yeah. Well, my my dad was a, um, a radio disc jockey, so often people, artists, would come into the studio and, and talk to him because they were pushing their record. Um, they didn't have agents like they do now. And Nat King Cole was one of the people that came into the studio, my dad's studio. And, um, and he would bring them home for Christmas or for Sunday dinner because they didn't have anywhere to go if they were on their own. And, you know, so I, Nat King Cole sat at my dining room table. I mean, it was. Well, that's, that's interesting. I don't think I ever had anybody at my dining room table of any note. Yeah. You know, uh, protests are certainly not new. The uh, Boston Tea Party was a protest. In fact, the whole Revolutionary War, I guess, was a protest. Yep. But um, uh, getting into World War I, a, a lot of us were very upset about that and didn't want to do that, especially since. Um, can't think of the president's name. It promised us that was not going to Woodrow happen. Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, yes. And uh, But once we were in it, they came up with a thing called the Sedition Act where you could not speak out against the war. You could be you. You'd be in really? trouble. You were breaking the law if you uh, went into the local gin mill and said, "You know, I think the Germans are doing a better job than we are." Or why are we doing that? You could be put in jail for it. This was World War One. World War One. Yeah. Wow. Oh. And I'm not sure how long that lasted. It was gone by World War Two, but okay. yeah. And That's we frequently criticized the uh, the Third Reich for, uh, you know, Hitler did the same thing. Okay. If you uh, mm -hmm. is sitting in the local gym, well, they called it a beer house, and said that the war's not going very well. Gestapo could have you gone, and you're in Dachau before you know yeah. it. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm glad that we actually have a First Amendment right. Yeah, well, we did that too, but it was kind of hazy, exactly what it was. Yeah. But there were protests, and there was a, uh, and, and, and again, I talked before about conning people into having to go to war. And there was a song called Over There that was again used for, for World War II and, and uh, had, had, uh, had words like, get your gun on the run, make your father proud to have had such a boy, things like that, like, get your gun on the run. Yeah, don't stop to ask any questions yeah, or just right. get the gun, get the uniform and go over there. 
And then there were answers to that, so songs like I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier. Mm -hmm. That was a, a popular hit. But, but over there, it wasn't even a hit. I mean, it was just like a national anthem. We're coming to get those guys, and that's that. We won't when come we back got, till it's over over there. When we got to World War II, um, it was a long time before the United States weighed in, wasn't it? Was there, yeah. was a, there was a lot of, you know, yeah. no, we're not going to participate in a war that's not on on our in our country and right. So and, a, and all the time Roosevelt did want to participate. He thought it was important mm -hmm. and was kind of uh, not negotiating, but dealing with uh, can't think of the <laughs> the English guy now. Oh, Winston Churchill. Winston yeah. Churchill. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is several different versions of how we got involved in that. Of course, with the sinking of the, uh, that wasn't the Lusitania. What was it? Uh, wasn't it? Lusitania is how we got in World War I. Oh, the Japanese. The Japanese attacked us. Pearl and, Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Per, yeah. yeah, and what the deal was is the Japanese had a, a pact with the Germans. Right. And even though they attacked us, well, then, of course, we declared war on them. And because we declared war on them, then the Germans came in to be part of that. Good uh, um, grief. So you know, it, it, isn't it true, though, that what we have are basically old white men making the decisions about sending the young boys? Of course. To and I know their kids going. You know, their kids got to... Uh, Burns bones, bones burns. burns. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, well, I, I, I was I was drafted, and at the time I was in the army, virtually everybody was drafted. There were very few people that volunteered at that time. There were some, but uh, and I, when you're drafted, it's kind of a, a, a it's a homogenized situation because they're taken from all walks of life, and. I had uh, an Olympic runner, I had a professional football player who I had never heard of, but the other guys did. Mm. All kinds of people that had scooped up in the draft. But I didn't have any rich people, mm. and I didn't have any politicians. Now they managed. Yeah, somehow or other they, they uh, did that. something else. I think it might be valuable to look earlier in American history. Before the revolution, there were protests of a variety of, for a variety of reasons uh, in various colonies. Some of them were about uh, who was making the money in that colony, and mm. uh, Shays' Rebellion took place in, in upstate New York. And when it came time for the Constitution, some basic things were not resolved when the Constitution was adopted at all, and that's where we came to the point of the First Amendment. The first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, came later. And they were because of issues that were not resolved in the Constitution itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them still aren't quite resolved today. Mm -hmm. And including those in the most basic and important of the amendments, the First Amendment. Free speech, mm -hmm. free press, uh, right to assemble for the redress of grievances, mm -hmm. uh, non-establishment of religion but the free exercise thereof. Right. And some of these very things are, are still issues today, including in little Brookings, Oregon, oh, yeah. where they think the First Amendment doesn't seem to apply to them. Right, right. Yep. Uh, and uh, anyway, through the years, there's been protests on all sorts of things. And in many cases, uh, they became violently dealt with, uh, terribly uh and they had to do with slave rebellions. They had to do with uh, whiskey and taxation and all of that. And uh, although the First Amendment, with its freedom of assembly and the redress of grievances and free speech and all that, uh, over the years, there have been many, many examples of rebellions and protests that were squashed awfully uh, by killing people, by other means. And... Uh, we might think the First Amendment has resolved a lot of things historically, but it hasn't because there are governmental agencies that keep ignoring it. During the Vietnam War, the, the demonstrations turned into more, more than demonstrations. They turned into a movement and almost a, a civil war. And it, it was 
you kind of, how far will these people go? I mean, they blew up buildings, they burned draft records, they did all this kind of stuff. And, and I, like I said, I was not part of that. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to this day to say that I was right wing Republican in those days. You knew that, what you knew. <laughs> that was. Well, I had just been an army sergeant, and right. that's, and I. But now, looking back, and I say, well, what were they protesting? They were protesting 500 young men, mostly young men, being killed a week in a war that we had no business being in whatsoever, none, and could not win. And we knew that, that I, I have an, an, an example of, I was in a firefight one time, and we called an air cover, and a jet came down, and this, this is like screaming out of the sky. I don't know if it's an F-14 or what the hell it is, but it's a jet, comes down within just a couple of hundred feet of the ground, drops a bomb, boom, and takes off. And as it's taking off, I'm hearing bang, bang, bang. There was somebody with a bolt-action rifle shooting at this jet. So this is like World War I gun shooting at wow. this. And I thought, we ain't never going to win this. Hmm. If they can continue to do that when... We're dropping bombs. And when I say bomb, I mean boom, you know? Right. Big, 50 big yards away, you're getting sprayed with leaves and whatever. So. Right. Your mention of uh, the Vietnam era protests getting stronger and more out of hand, uh, one should also look at those days in terms of government response. Uh, we, we do know about Kent State. Uh, we do some know about Jackson State, where there were also students murdered by by the government uh, in protest uh, on Jackson State, of course, is in Mississippi, and right. and these were not white people, and uh, but uh, there was real escalation on the part of the government, and uh, in Oakland, uh, I had a rather scary experience. Uh, Oakland had what was called a uh, induction center that. Uh, most people from Northern California being inducted into the military had to go through there to have their bones first checked out <laughs> and, 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 and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was pretty massive protest by a lot of students from Berkeley and elsewhere uh, against these inductions going on there. And there was a stop the draft week. Mm -hmm. First day of stop the draft week, the police rioted. Oh, uh, in terrible form in, in on the streets of Oakland. And uh, the a lot of people be, beat up, some arrested and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next day, I was, uh, I was a seminary student in the Bay Area at that time. The next day, a large group of clergy and seminarians decided they were going to stand between the police and the protesters. And uh, we did so with... Uh, uh, clerical collars and appropriate liturgical guard and all that, and we didn't know what was going to happen. No. But uh, we we sang songs in the face of the cops, and uh, all of that sort of thing was going on. And but anyway, the the history of protest has always been violent, and most of the violence has been on the on the part of government. Well, even when it's on the part of the. The protesters, uh, you know, I think you were alluding to this, Ray, that y you have to look at what they what they were fighting for. Exactly, you have to yeah. look at what was on the line. Exactly. What was on the line was, you know, our young men, my generation, were being killed daily. We were losing American boys daily with this. We and And that was the motivation was stop the killing. It's not like... Oh, you know, we've got a little bit of injustice going on. It was vital that we stop it. When you look at 58,000 plus people that were killed, and are still dying, by the way, there's mm -hmm. still people Agent dying Orange. today from uh, Vietnam injuries and uh, Agent Orange exposure yep. and PTSD and just tons and tons and tons of, of, of things that are bad. Yep. No. That, that certainly justifies the fact that. Um, yeah, do what you have to do as far as protests go. I remember I, I also had a scary experience, Robert. Um, I was eight and a half months pregnant mm. at the time and um, absolutely 
showed up for all of the protests because that was important. Um, and a group had taken over the uh, five freeway in San Diego. Um, and it was it was our group. It was protesters. Um, I didn't go down there because, as I say, I was eight and a half months pregnant, rather large. Um, and I was at the back of the group of demonstrators. So I figured I was pretty safe. You know, I'm, I'm watching while the cops are beating the crap out of the people, the demonstrators. And this one woman actually had a prosthesis on her leg. She, so she only had one leg and it came off and the cop is standing over beating her. I mean, it was just, it was horrific. Um, and I happened to look behind me. Remember, I'm the last person in the, you know, in the march, as it were. I look behind me and here's the San Diego cops lined up behind me in full riot gear. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, uh -huh. I think I'm just going to fade away <laughs> here because I'm, so I'm going to get hurt. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And it was Kent State. That was when I stopped trusting my government. Because if the National Guard, if your government is willing to kill you when you are protesting peacefully, because that's what they were doing. And it was about, about Cambodia, especially. And, and, and four Jackson State. And, students. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. They, you know, it's never been shown that, uh, I guess, which guardsmen did the actual shooting. But evidently, a lot did do some shooting because they could show, if it was just three or four, you could tell by the guns being fired. But what the hell were they doing with live ammunition anyway at all? It makes no sense at all. Well, you know, it's, it, it you was... You give a 19-year-old kid a gun and tell him, hey, you can kill people. Right, but you don't, know. right? Yeah, yeah. But, but don't unless you absolutely have to, and right? You just have to have one take a shot. And no, somebody, exactly. And then all of a sudden, it's, they're shooting at us. Bang, 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 bang. No, exactly. And, you know, I, I understood at the time that the, the young men that were going to fight in the Vietnam War, uh, they believed they were doing what was right. I felt it was like my job to try to convince them that maybe they had been, you know, I don't know, lied to or, or misinformed at any rate. Um, so I tried, you know, I, because you, you got to stand up for what you believe in. You just... I was there 67, 68, and I would have to say that just about every... I don't recall anybody protesting or doing anything like that. It was all, well, we're up here and uh, we're going to win this war and blah, blah, blah. Right. I got out of the com out of combat when the drugs started coming in. Fortunately, I got out of that. We, we had what we called an infusion. I went over and joined the 9th Division. Now, the 9th Division was drafted and trained as a unit, went over as a unit. So uh, during the course of that one year, you have to infuse them with other people so you don't have the whole division going home on the same day. Right. And uh, so naturally, if you get a chance to get, trade some of your people to another unit, you're not going to give them your best and your brightest. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so then drugs started coming into my unit, and, mm -hmm. and I'm, we're out on a patrol one day, and I realized I don't know the name of the guy in front of me or behind me, and, and people were bringing drugs out on patrol. I said, nope. This ain't no place for drugs. <laughs> no, because you don't know if they're high yeah, or God, not. Yeah, and, got very you know, scary then. Yeah. But I still don't remember, like, uh, people in country complaining about the war. 71, 72 was when, when I got active. Yeah. Uh, that, it was after I left, long after I left, that they started things like fragging and stuff. And right. there's a movie called... Uh, oh, Jane Fonda did did a did a show with a bunch of people called and the movie's called Sir No Sir. But there's another movie before that that talks about guys just saying, No, we're not going. Mm -hmm. We're not going out on patrol tonight. There was many times we wanted wow. to say that, but of course we didn't. Right. Um scary. Scary stuff. About the protests that developed in late fifties, throughout the sixties and seventies, much of its discipline was created by the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. The civil rights movement was uh, fortunately committed to nonviolence and not only committed to it, 
but learned about techniques to protect people and to still make a, a effective protest, but uh, what have you. And uh, anyway, that uh, famously, for example, there was a place called Highlander Folk School in Tennessee and, or Kentucky. I always get those two states mixed up. And that was a perhaps communist-based uh, training place hmm. on nonviolent passive resistance. And hmm. people had to understand mm -hmm. that the first thing is you were willing to discipline yourself in such a way that you would not fight back mm -hmm. and that you would be willing to face the consequences. Mm. And uh, that's not always easy. And uh, I experienced some of this myself in a, in a rather unusual way. Even though I went to Ber or was around Berkeley in Oakland, uh, I wound up going, because of my interest in theology and that, to a school in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, Indiana is quite different from Berkeley back then and oh, still yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, and it was an unusual school. It was a senior college, for all male. That was that denomination's nature. And uh, anyway... Stuff was going on in the South, and suddenly Southern leaders like George Wallace and Wilbur Barnett were coming to Fort Wayne to get Northern support. Mm. And here I was in there and wound up leading civil rights demonstrations, which were pretty much new to Fort Wayne. And uh, I, you know, I thought about the stuff about being willing to accept whatever the consequences were. And uh, but I didn't quite realize how dramatic it was going to become. Uh, I uh, that evening, several of us went to a bar, a, a beer place that we often went to, Lutherans or beer drinker types. And uh, the news came on, and there I was the first one interviewed on on the news about our demonstration. And uh, I think you know, interesting. And but all of a sudden, it started getting really quiet in that bar, and we saw some signaling going on to the bartender and pointing and this and that, and we didn't know quite what was going on. We knew it was getting scary and uh, thought it might be a weapon or what have you. But it turned out uh, what they were signaling was to get a eight and a half by 10 glossy photograph of a lynching. And not just any lynching, a lynching that had happened eight miles away. Many lynchings happen in the American North. We don't think of it just as a Southern phenomenon, if you, if you look at it. And they started passing it around, and they were making comments about no more problems there, or uh, these students got to learn some lessons and this and that. And they handed it to me, and my response was, or what do you think of that? They said, and I said, the most obscene thing I've ever seen. And there was long silence. And then somebody cracked a joke or said something, I don't know what it was, but we soon realized it was time to get out of there. Yep. But uh, you when you're going around these parts, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Agitator from out of town. Yeah, I mean, yep. exactly. What is the. Oh, yeah, you know, I forgot to mention this earlier. If you want to participate in this show, and you might have something to say. We have the ability to accept your text, and then we have a person that can read who will read that text. Here's the number. Get your pen ready. 541-661-4098. 541-661-4098. First radio station I'm known to have textual intercourse. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Robert. Yeah, we'll, have to, yeah, we'll have to put that in our promos. <laughs> <laughs> and you are listening to KCIW LP 100.7 on your FM dial. Coming to you from beautiful Brookings, Oregon. All volunteer radio station. If you want to participate in one of these talks someday, uh, just uh, KCIW.org and you'll see the places you should be clicking to do that. And we'll have you sitting in here at one of these chairs. It really is fun. I mean, for any for anybody who's you know not afraid to to talk and speak their mind, this is this is just a delight to be able to sit around a table and and just chat about stuff. Yes, it's really good stuff. 
and they don't pay us or anything. No, I they often don't. wonder why they don't pay. Because <laughs> we're all volunteers. That's okay. why they don't. Pay. Somebody mentioned uh, uh, Oakland being an induction center, uh, and it reminded me of something. Uh, I, I, my induction center was was Whitehall Street, the same place that um, um, what's his name did in the movie. Okay. What's his name? Yeah. What's his name in the movie? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you have to give us some clue. Uh, this here. is this is an informal uh, show. Arnold Guthrie. Alice's restaurant. Arnold Guthrie. Uh, okay. okay. Alice he that left no part untouched and all that in, in the line and all that. I think everybody kind of flew through. I flew through, and uh, so I get drafted. Here I am down the line a few months, and I'm in medic training. And in medic training, they uh, you use the guy at the, at the table next to you as the person you're practicing this procedure on. You give them shots. and this. So this day we're learning about blood pressure, and uh, everybody's taking the blood pressure, their bench mate or whatever, and instructor's going, oh, well, what did you get and what did you get? And he gets to one person, and, and he says, uh, it's 200 over 85 or something. And the uh, instructor said, you did it wrong, do it again. So after two or three times, the instructor did it, and he gently escorted that guy out of the room. Because he, 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 he said, I, yeah. ready to he said I told him, turn the physical, I had high blood pressure. But how could you, how, you know, that's wow. something that you do every time you go to the doctor's. In fact, I had at the dentist's office the other day. Right, that time, right, so. right. Yeah, that's how really critically careful this these uh, induction physicals were. Mm. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit today um, was getting into the whole Israeli-Palestinian, um, the, the demonstrations that are going on. Because I think that, at least from, from where I'm sitting, it's not anti-Semitic. That's... Of course not. No. And while they're, you know, they're they're trying to you know, cast it in that light, that is not at all what's going on. You can be against having um, 35,000 women and children killed by bombs without being anti-Semitic. Yeah, it has nothing to do with uh, with religion at all. No. We had a, a, a person in here uh, a few weeks ago who was taught, we briefly spoke about a protest, and, and he said, well, protests are all right, you know, but they don't have to break things and, and leave a mess behind and camp out. And, and I said, leave a mess behind? I said, do you realize what they're protesting? Right. They can camp out. They can leave a mess. They can break windows. They can do what they want. People are dying. That's you don't right. stop right. people from dying. Who, uh, who was it that you, uh, you can't make an omelet unless you break, break some eggs? Break a few eggs. Yeah. yeah exactly. No, it... it it's ironic to me that it is the Israeli government that is doing this. Committing atrocities, you mean? Unbelievable mm -hmm. atrocities. Yeah. 35,000, mostly women and children. I, 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 I'm almost speechless. It, yeah, it, it defies understanding. And the Israeli position has been this is an appropriate route response to what Hamas did without paying attention to what's been going on for 45, 50 years there. Right. Yeah. And with uh, European powers during World War II basically saying that, uh, well, these people need a place to live and their historic place is Israel, so why, why don't we get them all to move over there and then be less of a European problem? And the trouble was that Palestinians were already there, and just to shove them off their land and pretend that they don't exist there created an enormous problem that's not been resolved. And it's oiled by all sorts of oil in the Middle East. It's uh, complicated by a lot of money for arms and things like that. Uh, earlier, there was a, a mention of uh, the Vietnam War as being a place where American arms sellers made money because of their ammunition and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, Dwight Eisenhower, former U.S. Uh, general, <laughs> general, as well as president, warned just about this 
mm-hmm. military industrial complex mm-hmm. that will get rich by selling arms, by selling weapons, by fomenting uh, rebellions in various parts of the world. Those will be the, the ones that will profit, and that's stealing from the education of children. And those are Eisenhower's own words. Wow. In case you want to participate, he'll give you that text number one more time. No, actually, I'll give you a lot more time, but this time, no, <laughs> one more time. 541-661-4098. 541-661-4098. Operators are standing by. Breathlessly. Breathlessly. <laughs> we so, we, we so want to know of, what you think. That kind of brings you back to, you know, the purpose, again, of the demonstrations. So we, we're looking at the, at the demonstrations on campuses here in, the, in our country that are pro-Palestinian. Absolutely. Not anti-Semitic. But anti-Israel. But certainly anti Bombing government of Israel, anti Netanyahu. Yes, you know, like stop killing these innocent people. Stop it and feed them and let, feed let, them. Let, let, them, let them, them eat. Let them have medical care. Exactly, exactly. It's like it's, and I'm, you know, I, I don't understand why uh, President Biden has not taken a stand about this. Because you may not think it's a Jewish question, but the Jews may think it's a Jewish question, and that's what he's worried about. Yeah. It's political. He has to be political. Yeah. He needs the Jewish vote. But what is more political in the world than killing people? I mean, if you you think about it for a minute, 35,000, that's more than the entire population of Curry County. So think about that. Entire population of Curry County and probably half of Del Norte, non-existent, just non-existent. W- women, children, fathers, brothers, um, little children. Yep. Uh, yep. I mean, pregnant, how can you pregnant women losing that? their pregnancy. How can you do it? And, and I'm not, you know, by no means am I saying that Hamas should not have been punished and that there shouldn't what, have been a reckoning. They, what were they thinking? You know, uh, you don't you don't tug on Superman's cape. Yeah, yeah. And and that's I think it, they it's were well known actually, that you mess with Israel and you are in a lot of trouble. So I think they were actually hoping that this was going to happen, not right. not as decimated, right. right? But I think that they that Hamas was looking. They to, knew something would happen. Absolutely, yeah. and they were hoping that they would somehow get a foothold and some of the other countries would come to their aid and mm, you know it's just it, the opposite is happening except that a lot of a lot of the world is looking at Israel right mm. now and going guys you got to get a well he's got to get a clue and yeah has been indicted on world courts so yeah norway ireland and mm, other yeah. country just recently recognized the palestinian authority as the legitimate right. uh, government of of uh, thoughts on that, and I think most people, most reasonable people, um, see the two-state solution as the only real possibility. Yeah. I mean, you cannot, you cannot get rid of the Palestinians. I mean, it's like saying we're going to get rid of the homeless. I mean, come on, they're human beings. Yeah, you can kill them all, and and certainly that looks like what's going on, right? I mean, that sounds like genocide to me. You know, we don't, we don't re- realize that we, we live in a country that, at least for the mainland, has never been attacked, never been occupied by, by, by a foreign army. We've never uh, heard a shot fired and angered for the most part. Right. And when you think about these people go to bed at night not knowing if their house is still going to be there. Uh, not knowing if their children are going to be alive, not knowing where food is going to come from. I mean, all of these things that are actually happening to real people. Yeah, exactly. We go back to a little Vietnam story. When uh, Being a medic, I set up at, at night when we were out on any kind of an operation with what's called the Command CP. The, it was the, uh, if we had a priest with us, that were, and uh, a company commander, platoon leader, things like that. And... 
Of course, being the bosses, they would pick the most pl- comfortable place to set up. And one night we were set up in a village anyway. And you would, what happened? You set out in a more or less circular pattern. You set out listening posts and groups of three people. And I was in, in one of the buildings because that, oh, I wouldn't call it a building in the grass hut. Right. Uh, because that's where the bosses are going to stay. So we're in there and it's a little, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe maybe 20 feet square room, straw hut, just like you said on television. And these two elderly people in there who were just sitting around minding their own business and all of a sudden guys with guns come in and start setting up places around their house. And, and they're doing this thing, this praying thing with their hands and, and they're terrified as anybody would of be. Course. And most of these houses would have like a little, lo- I'd call it an altar, I don't know, uh, with religious things on it. And they, they, on that, there was a picture of a young man in a Vietnamese uniform. And they kept pointing to him and pointing to him, and it just their way of saying, "Hey, look, we're on your side. Exactly. We're the good guys, you know." Exactly. And we don't speak the language, and that's as best we can do is point to the picture. And after a while, I I don't really remember, but they must have relaxed when they realized that we were weren't going to hurt them. But we're still sitting around their house, sleeping in their house with in guns. Their house. Yes. And uh, you didn't ask, I yeah. think. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. We don't realize how lucky we are. You know, we get really pissed off if a neighbor has a barking dog. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable to me. Another aspect of the military-industrial complex is how many uh, high-ranking officers of the military wind up once they retire <laughs> uh, working for Lockheed or yeah. Bart Grumman and all, all of these yep. large makers of weapons and makers of aircraft and and all have you, and that makes a terrible distortion of the whole American economy. And meanwhile, uh, those who, uh, you know, were warriors all of a sudden become people making an enormous amount of money in the process of selling arms and weapons. And, and the, the whole point is to kill people. I mean, I, you know, I, I keep coming back to that. It's like, that's the point of war. That, that's the purpose, mm. to kill people. I saw a thing the other day on, on, on the news. I guess everybody probably saw it where they have these uh, jets now that are controlled by AI. And I think when they're actually flying, they won't even have a pilot in them. But they're doing dogfights and all that type of thing, remote. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, pretty soon we won't even have any people in the wars. I mean, they'll just be blowing up each other's remote tanks or whatever. But there will still be people dying, yes. I would assume. Boy, I, uh, I don't know how many times I've watched some of the things that, that exist today in warfare that I wish we had had. Mm-hmm. A drone. Mm-hmm. One drone would have been nice. We could fly over and see who's where, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I see stuff on uh, on YouTube a lot that... They, they'll show the uh, Ukrainian and Russian some of those interactions. And they've got definitely had drones, and those drones are dropping bombs like from way up high. And, you know, it's just, wow, could we just stop? I don't know. Could we just stop, right? <laughs> it just seems silly. Seems silly to be wanting to kill people. Oh, looks like we may have some communication here. So we got a text that says, before any peace between Palestine and Israel takes place, and yes, a two-state solution is the only way. Israel must give back all settlements they've created on Palestinian land, and the Palestinians must renounce Hamas and all other terrorist organizations affiliated with Hamas. Sadly, I don't believe that will happen in my lifetime of 15 to 25 years. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, um, yeah that's a simple solution. Why don't we just do that? Yeah. What, it, that's, 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 well. Uh, could we see show our hands in here? Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. I know. I know. But, you know, Israel does not want to let go of any of the land that they have confiscated. I mean, that's where their settlements have been, right? I mean, it's not their land, but they've taken it. Yeah, I, I mean, seriously. And, and the hostages, 
I mean, there there's still hostages that are being held by Hamas, and they're not they're not giving them back. And, well, I and, think they know if they do give them back, there'll be there'll be no mercy whatsoever, and they'll just you know isn't the fear now that we could hurt the hostages, and that's why they're not rolling across with tanks and that. I or, don't think Netanyahu is the least bit concerned. Well, not him personally, with them personally, but I think he would be uh, concerned about the fallout. He might be, but I mean, you know, wouldn't wouldn't it be? If he were really concerned about the hostages, would he not have gone for the ceasefire? I mean, that would be a way to get closer to sending the hostages back. Clean night. I'm sure Trump would say he's a strong leader. Yeah, exactly. Very strong leader. <laughs> Very strong leader, yes. Yeah, what's okay, the... Okay, so uh, once again, text number here is 541 Six six one four zero nine eight five four one six six one four zero nine eight, and you can have your text read like the previous text person did. Yeah, operators I know it's. Just, go ahead. I'm sorry. Operators are standing by yes. now. Poor Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, she's sitting, not standing. So. Well, it's a, still a standby <laughs> yes. situation. Yes, yeah, she's like the Proud Boys. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's it's. I know it's a very complicated issue, um, and you know they said the same thing about the Vietnam War. It's a very complicated issue. It's there, there's nothing simple about it, and yet there's something very simple about saying that each life is important. Each life, and we won't take any more lives. We're not going to kill anymore, especially innocent civilians. You know, uh, Vietnam was sure simple when they decided to make it simple. Get on the helicopters and get the hell out of here. Exactly. And the tanks rolled in one direction while we're rolling out the other direction, leaving behind thousands and thousands of civilians that had worked with us. Yep. Uh, it's just unbelievable. And, who? and the odd thing is, I've, I have not gone back myself. And, I would, except I can't bear spending that much time in an airplane anymore, but uh, when Americans go there, the Vietnamese people love us. And from what I'm told, they're really not taught in school a whole lot about the Vietnam War, so it's kind of it depends on the people who actually remember it and know what was going on, and they've all been re-educated to think that things were as bad as they, they we thought. And I saw a movie a while back that supposedly was... This portion of it was filmed in uh, Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City, which is called Saigon a lot anyway. Uh, and it looks like a modern city. It looks like Las Vegas. And I don't know if that was real or what, but um, if at wow. least they've certainly made some progress. Big yeah. skyscrapers and things. Were, when I was in Vietnam, oh, Saigon barely had lights. Yeah, and I'm not sure that's progress, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, a, 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 a while back, I bought uh, some boots, and the boots were made in Vietnam. And I hmm. thought, well, this is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, if if way back when we had gone straight from uh, where we were to just making boots, we could have skipped killing all those damn people. Just, you know, and, and, it, and again, how many civilians, you know, how oh, many? Countless, countless, countless. Um and those poor people. Uh, in North Vietnam, can you imagine being bombed like that in North Vietnam? Mm -hmm. And civilians like the people who I mentioned that we moved into their house, mm -hmm. uh, getting killed in, in uh, bombing runs. A favorite tactic of the Viet Cong was we would, we would be on what they call search and destroy missions, which actually meant go for a walk till they shoot at you and then you know where they are. And, and we're crossing the rice paddy, and it was very common think for them to be on the other side of the village and fire a couple of sniper rounds at us. Well, that is tugging on Superman's cape, and we uh, form up then and bring in airstrikes and do whatever and attack the village. And meanwhile, the guys that fired the shots are long gone, and we're coming online and doing all those things with tartan training, and, and so finally we get into the village, and all the little houses there had bunkers, and they were made out of mud and... and 
for, for just this reason, you know, if there's a firefight. And so we come up to a bunker and we hear things in there. So there's somebody in this bunker. And they, they, they were bomb shelters. Not, mm -hmm. And uh, so we're yelling at them in English, come on out, we won't hurt you, come on. We did a lot of good English. Yeah. We had nobody with us at that time that spoke Vietnamese. And finally, we just said, well, the hell with this, started chucking grenades in. And literally brought bodies out in pieces, including like grandma and grandpa, who you could tell were hovering over the kids to, to protect them, and several people dead, and and it was just a big mess. So after that, we decided ourselves, not the company, we decided that we were going to carry tear gas grenades from now on, along with our others. A tear gas grenade, actually, those can can find. Places could kill them anyway, but it'd be able to have a chance. I'd like we, to, we were not going to throw grenades because yeah. the lieutenant said throw grenades. And, I'd like to talk a little more about the protests that are going on now in campuses across the country. And part of what's interesting about it is those protesting realize that those campuses are enormous centers of money and wealth and power and connections to corporate America, connections to rich America. And they're really trying to say, look, we came here to be educated. A lot of us are going to be stuck with student loans for a long, long time. And we want to have some say about how this place is governed, where those funds wind up being used, and what we can do to at least lessen our own participation in making this war and this genocide go on. And that's really noble and strong, and I'm so proud of so many people being willing to say that. Uh, universities for a long time have gotten away with, with just being a, a place that receives a lot of money from those who uh, are not necessarily interested in the welfare of students. It's just part of the corporate state that this is. Right. And uh, anyway, I admire what they've done. I am appalled by the response of a lot of the universities and now the response of members of Congress in trying to govern them. But I'm really proud that they have continued a tradition that goes back a long way in American history to say that if something's wrong, to exercise one's constitutional right to seek the redress of grievances. You know, and I think it's important um, to recognize the fact that the, the universities are where, theoretically at least, um, you are encouraged to think. <laughs> You're encouraged to exercise the gray cells and to actually re look at a problem from many different sides and understand the problem and ultimately work it out in your own mind exactly exactly but but using your intelligence right using using the tools that a university actually provides for you so it it's of course that there's that the universities are going to be the center of this kind of of protest mm -hmm. that it's a, it's an of course they are because that's where the people who are busy thinking and not necessarily having to go to work every day to put food on the table but actually are engaged in learning mm -hmm. that that's who's there so i mean seriously of course that's where the protests are happening and and to say that that it's wrong because they are they are standing their ground and saying we won't have any more killing we won't have the university that i'm paying money to to go to school here we won't have them giving money to the industrial you know complex that funds the war and we won't have it and you know they've got not only a perfect right but Good for them. Good for standing on their conscience. And, and along with lives, people dying, there's also the terror that we talked about earlier, that this is your life now. Yeah. You, you can't get up in the morning and go to 7-Eleven and get a cup of coffee or something like we can. 
or just do all the things we can do or most people in the world can do. And those people are starving. They're starving. Yeah. You know, I've I've seen pictures of the of the babies, the children. They're starving. How is that remotely okay? I wonder how uh when when this all cools down a bit, how Netanyahu sees Israel being viewed by the rest of the world. I mean, it's bad right now no. when it's all over. Right. When lose or draw, what what are what is the rest of the world going to think of Israel? It I, I mean, it can't be good. It can't be good. I mean, the, really, the only person who's standing with Israel right now is Biden. Mm. I mean, I don't think the U.S. is. Has Trump just stayed out of it? Has he said it's up to the states or something? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. I actually don't know what he's what he said. Maybe it's like the uh, 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 Gettysburg battle that he said was mean and rotten and people dying and blood. But in many ways, it was quite very beautiful. Wonderful, he said. Yeah. And then how? Right? How? Yeah. I can't. I just. I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> no. What is our text number again, Ray? Okay, yeah, we well, have that. I really will be doing it one more time. This time is 541 661 4098. And you have a few minutes that you can get it, very few minutes now, that you can get in here. And you are listening to Curry Cafe on KCIW LP 100.7 FM, coming to you from beautiful. Really beautiful today, but <laughs> Brookings, Oregon. You can go to the car show down at the beautiful beach. It is a gorgeous day. And today was airport day. And I've had airplanes yeah, and... So a little helicopters. And helicopters, okay, yeah. absolutely. One of our board members, Doug Hansen, is up he's, there flying. Yeah, I'm sure he's glad it's a nice day because he was talking oh. the other day about it being windy and he'd have people throwing up in his airplane. Which was... Well, it, it the wind did start to pick up. It was pretty good until about one one thirty, and then it started picking up again. Oh. So I don't know what it's like up there. Yes. I used to be well paid to fly in general aviation airplanes and I don't like it one bit. I like flying when I have a nice person filling my glass frequently. <laughs> Real frequently. <laughs> I like flying, but I don't like it in, in this kind of turbulence. It's not. No, no, turbulence ain't no fun, especially since it's killing people in the air right now. Yes. Yeah, it's 747s and yeah. bouncing off the ceiling. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Okay, I should remind you one more time here that you can be a part. Whoops, we have a we have a message coming in. Yes, we do. We can do this quickly because we only have a minute. I just hope people realize that Zionists want to wipe out all Palestinians. That's 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 straight yeah. and simple. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Billy Ruth. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's appalling, really. It's appalling because to me, that's that is the same. It's the same as the mass extermination of the Jews. It's the same. And it's like your father saying, well, they're the same as us, just a different skin color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Down to last minute. Anybody have any closing comments here? I was thinking of mentioning an experience I had a couple times, and that was trying to get arrested in a protest and not getting arrested. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, this... Uh, most notably happened during the Republican National Convention in 1964, Cal Palace, Daly City in near San Francisco. And uh, probably a thousand of us had gathered to block the main entrances of, of the Cal Palace and stop those people from getting out. Well, they figured out how to get, let, let them out all at the other end of the building, <laughs> and we were just stuck there. And that happened another time in a... Uh, a protest in a car dealership as well. Okay, 10 seconds left. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you for my guests for being here. KCIW.org, if you want to get in touch with us. <laughs>